Sarah Smith. I am starting at St. Raphael School this year. And um, Presbyteria Maria wanted us to just, if we had time, to do a little mini lesson, tell about our classes, what we're offering. And um, so that's what I'm doing right now. I am here to tell you about the Survey of Torah class that I'm, I will be offering in the fall. Um, so it's called Survey of Torah. It is about the Torah or the Pentateuch. Now, what is that? The Torah or the Pentateuch refers to the first five books of the Bible. They are attributed to being authored by Moses. They are um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, I will say up front that my class will not cover Deuteronomy. I will only cover the first four books. That's an intentional choice. Um, the first four books of the Bible are very much referencing nomadic people, a people who live by tribes, a people who live by elders, a people who live um, off the land in a very unique way in the desert. Deuteronomy takes the same information that is presented in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, but it has been edited and edited and edited. So it's, it's the same feasts and laws and priesthood, but they have updated it to work in an urban environment. They've updated it to work under the reign of King David and all of his descendants. So it's more political. It's more about central power. It's less about elders. It's less about tribes. And it's less about living off the land. Because of that, I have omitted that completely from this course because it would muddy the law, the tabernacle, because again, they're going to update to a temple. So it's I've just removed Deuteronomy completely from this class, and that was an intentional choice. So I'm going to tell you, what is Torah? Why should I take this class, especially as an Orthodox? Um, Torah means law or instruction, teaching in Hebrew. And I will say, I'm going to date myself a little bit, um, from Pirates of the Caribbean, which was all the rage when I was in middle school and high school. There's a line that says, the Pirates Code is more like guidelines. It's not an actual code. And I will say that is very true to Torah. These are guidelines of how you live. What happens when someone comes to the tabernacle and they have leprosy? What happens when someone in your town commits this offense? What do you do? It is not strict dogma. You might get slightly different conflicting things. You're going to learn how one should deal with it because we live a holy life that God has revealed to us in a place of worship and in a context of a people who are his. And so if we look at these laws as if it's dogma, if it's, if it's good or bad or right or this, it's we're, we're missing that we are people who are called to live together and we have to muddle through stuff together. And God has given us a place to do that and he's given us ways that we can navigate that. And that's what these first five books are. This is the rule book, if you will. When you're unsure and you have to consult something, this is what you consult, but it's always up to the priest or the elder or the king when you get later in Israel's history to really work out actually living that out. So that's what we're dealing with. We are dealing with living out our faith, and this is the beginning of it. So what I'm gonna, just going to walk through um, what these books are and how we would interact with them in this course because i'm telling you the orthodox is going to heavily come in is how does this relate to our orthodox worship how does this relate to our orthodox home life because it's it's still prevalent now within when it was when as it was first established it's it's the same um so without further ado um i will explain some of the actually the slight differences though in the book so genesis is very clear cut. It's about the beginnings. It's creation. It's the flood. It's why do we have people dispersed over the world? Why do we have um, a patriarch Abraham? And what is it with these 12 tribes? And like, who are these big patriarchs and matriarchs of the faith? Like, who are they and why do they matter? Genesis is very clear cut. It's in its own bubble. Um, and it will always come out, even in the New Testament, you are always referencing the patriarchs of Genesis. Um, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers are going to share a lot of the same material, but they are different. So Exodus is going to start very strongly with the people of God in Egypt and God claiming them and bringing them out of Egypt. That is very clear. That is very unique. 
The later part of Exodus is a whole bunch of law code, and we will get to law code, especially in the class. Like, what is law code? If you've heard of Ernamu, if you've heard of Hammurabi, if you haven't heard of these people, that's fine. Like, it's, I think I didn't hear of Hammurabi till I was a senior in high school. So, um, but these are famous people who had law codes. And so we're going to have the same thing in the Bible, is these law codes. And so... Exodus is is that, and it's a law code that is given to Moses, and he writes it down. Um, that's that is the traditional understanding of it. Um, um, Leviticus is going to be geared towards the priests, so the Levites, if you remember, are a tribe of of people within the larger Israel, but they live. So where other tribes have land and a place to call their own and a spot, Levites are, are more of a calling. They live within each tribe and they take care of the religious life of the people. Uh, the liturgical life, I should say, not the religious life because we're a nation of priests, but the, the liturgical life, they are, they are the, the head of it. And so Leviticus is very much their book. It's very much like if you are a Levite and you need the details of what you wear and how you eat and what you do and how you perform this and what happens if someone comes with this case, it's, it's geared towards being a Levite. Numbers is a telling of what happens to the people in the wilderness. So where Exodus is all about Moses and then a law code, him being given that on Mount Sinai. Numbers is we've wandered in the wilderness and a whole bunch of events happened. Some of those events are found in Exodus and some of them they're only really recounted in Numbers. So it's more of a detailed understanding of what happens in the wilderness. Now that being said, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, although they have those nuances, you're going to get tons of information overlapping between all of them that are very similar. So because of that, when we go through this class, I will be drawing from all of those books as we look at things, because they're all prevalent with each other. They all stack on each other. Um, so that being said, what is my class about? That was a lot of information. Go back, rewatch it if you need to. I threw a lot out there. Um, so the first unit is going to be called God's Promises. It's all about God's promises to the patriarchs. So we're going to really hit the patriarchs and matriarchs because there is a matriarchy in the Old Testament. It is there. It is not as loud as the patriarchy. But when you go through it with me, I'm going to point out some things that the women of Genesis do that in our culture seem very negative, but actually they are being good matriarchs and they are serving the best they can. And so that's going to be kind of really hit on is the patriarchy and the matriarchy and how God sets this in order. Um, we're gonna we're just gonna look at famous people and their stories. So we're gonna look at Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Rebecca, young Jacob, and older Jacob, um, and really get into Jacob because he's a he's an interesting character that sometimes is hard to swallow. And then we're gonna focus on the twelve tribes and also Joseph. We're gonna take some time to look at Joseph because during Holy Week, one of the bridegroom services, we compare Christ to Joseph. Um, and I think it's important to look at his story and at least see why do we compare Christ to this figure. It's very important to our Holy Week services. So we are going to take some time to look at that figure. Our second unit is all about God claiming a people. So we're going to be in Exodus. We're going to start with Moses. We're going to look at young Moses, baby Moses, his birth narrative, his childhood, him getting kicked out, well, fleeing Egypt. Um, then we're going to look at plagues. It might surprise a lot of people to know that it's not Moses versus Pharaoh. It is Yahweh, the God of Israel, versus all the gods of Egypt. And he slowly takes each one down. And so we're going to look at the plagues in that lens. Um, and also understand why does this matter? Because like in Revelation, you still get this imagery of the plagues in kind of these other books of the New Testament. So we're going to kind of look at that because that's important. We are going to hit Passover, the Red Sea, and the Golden Calf. Because in these events, God is going to very much stake a claim on his people. And it is so powerful that to this day, when we celebrate Pascha, we are celebrating Passover. That event 
is is Christ in breaking into the world and claiming a people. And so we're really going to look at that. We're going to look at them wandering in the wilderness, manna and water in the desert. Uh, guess what? We have manna and water in our communion when we go up and receive the body and blood of Christ at the Eucharist. That's what we're getting. We're going to talk about that. We're going to see the beginning of a priesthood while the people are wandering in the wilderness. We're going to see Jethro tell Moses, hey, you need elders. You can't do this by yourself. You need to point elders in each tribe, and you need to let people figure things out. And guess what? We see that in our, in our idea of bishops have presbyters. When you go to your priest, you're going to an elder who is there to stand in for the bishop. This is a structure that we see. We see it right away here in the Old Testament. And we're going to see tribal lines being drawn and how tribalism really is going to influence how worship works. We're going to get into that. Our third unit is God's tabernacle and how we worship. And this is where, as Orthodox, I'm really excited to explore. We're going to talk about the tabernacle, and we are going to compare it to our modern Orthodox churches. When we talk about a, a lampstand, and we talk about an incense altar, and we talk about all these things that are behind there, and the colors, and the veil, and the, oh man, we're going to say, where do we see this in our Orthodox churches? Because you do. You do see it in our Orthodox churches. We talk about um, offerings in the Old Testament. There's sin offerings and thank offerings and peace offerings and all these different things you have to do, how you offer them, what you do. Guess what? We're going to look at that and we're going to compare it again to communion or the Eucharist because it's there. What we do every Sunday liturgy is there in the Old Testament. This is where it's been laid down. This is the foundation. Feasts. We're going to look about, we're going to look at Passover, the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Pentecost. And guess what? As we study the Old Testament, what it looked like and what they did, you're going to see that we do it at Pascha. We do it at Transfiguration. We do it at Pentecost. I could keep going. These feasts that we celebrate every year have been established at the beginning when God established them. We still do them to this day. It has been totally fulfilled, though, by Christ. We're going to look at the priests. We're going to look at what they wear. They're going to look at what they do when they prefer to worship. And we're going to talk about how we see that in the Orthodox Church. Because guess what? It's all there. And then we're going to talk about um, the covenant being renewed. This covenant that has been established with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It is reestablished in the worship and the liturgy and the priesthood and how you worship. That covenant has been refulfilled. And we're going to look at that. I believe it's in Exodus. Um, I'm pretty sure it's an exodus. I'll, I'll go back and look at my notes. Um, then the fourth unit, God's law. I'm really excited about this. Again, this is going to be based off of law codes, but we're going to see a completely different way of, of how we make a holy life, how these law codes transform your life. We're going to talk about the Ten Commandments, like really what are the Ten Commandments about? Like, why do we have these rigid Ten Commandments? What are they? Why? We're going to talk about it. Dietary laws? These weird Old Testament dietary laws of like no pig and you can't eat seafood and you can't mix milk and meat together and you can't um, eat blood and you can't... What is this all about? And why don't we still do it? And how does this relate to our current practice of feasts and fasting? Because they are linked. So let's get back and look at them. Um, sickness. We're going to really look at what are all these weird laws about people with leprosy separating themselves, women with issues of blood separating themselves. Like what's going on? Why do we separate ourselves? What, what were they doing back then? And how does this relate to the churching of an infant and a 40-day blessing, which we currently do in the Orthodox Church? We're really, really, we're going to understand this stuff. Um, we're going to look at Sabbath. Why was Sabbath so important? And why did the Orthodox Church, or just the church in general at the time, um, start to do Sabbath and then a Lord's Day? And we still continue our liturgy on the Lord's Day. What do we do with that? Are we still supposed to practice Sabbath? How are they different? We're going to really get into that. Um, and then Holiness Code is a big thing. There's a whole section in Leviticus that we're going to get into, and it's all about like, don't glean your fields. Let let the poor and the needy take it. And that's what comes up in Ruth, by the way. If you're familiar with Ruth and Boaz, she gleans because Boaz was following the guidelines of the day. 
and he was letting the needy take from his field. So that's just one example of multiple ways that you're supposed to live in this community that all looks out for each other and takes care of each other. And those things that are there, we can apply today. You just kind of have to look and read at it and go, how does this work in all co- our culture? Um, and there's a, way that, there's a way that it works. And we're really just going to look. We're just going to look at law code. And I might, if there's time, even have you read a little bit of Hammurabi's law code. He's a famous guy. And it's really cool to see his code against the biblical code and see how does God say, this is how you live. This might be how the world lives. This might be how Hammurabi lives. But this is how we live. And there might be similarities, but there are also vast differences. And that's, it's really cool to see. Um, And then finally, at the very end, we will circle back around to Genesis, the first 11 chapters. It's called the primordial history. It's very messy. It's it's a little um, apocalyptic in nature. When I say apocalyptic, I mean, it's, it's, there's an unveiling, there's layers, there's things we don't quite understand. It's a completely different genre of literature. Um, and we, we need to kind of wrap our heads around that and learn how to navigate that. Um, I will use, my, my dad quoted this to me when I was young, and I'm, I'm going to bring it up here, is if, if you, if, if the United States was buried under Yellowstone, the volcano went off, we all instantly died, and our whole language was lost, our whole culture was lost, completely buried. A thousand years from now, if someone comes and digs us up out of the ash and they find a briefcase and inside of it is a Sports Illustrated, perfectly preserved, and they open up that Sports Illustrated and with an English dictionary, they look at it and they say, they read, Cardinals beat Giants 7-1, to one. Smith steals home, winning the game. You would picture little red birds defeating Neolithic creatures. Uh, Someone named Smith is stealing a house. And by stealing a house, someone wins a game. That's really weird. But we understand what it means because we know baseball. We're in on that. That's something that we have learned as a people who like sports and have established a game. So what is it in those first 11 chapters of Genesis that as a people of God, again, we have to study the tail end of the Torah as a people of God, understand who we are and what we're about. So when we go back and we learn about the world, the world when it was God and chaos, the world when he subdued things, the world when he put things to right, the world where he had to fix very strong um, sin. What are we looking at? And that's how you appreciate our God. Because after he's called us and claimed us, we understand what we were claimed from. So we will end at the beginning. Um, So... If any of that sounds interesting to you, please take my survey of Torah class. It's open for middle, um, the middle school and upper school, which I think is seventh grade and higher. Um, Presbyterian Maria would know. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what it's about. Um, if you want to know more about me, you can just go check out my class um, on, on the page and like read about me in my syllabus. But anyway, that's that. I hope to see you in my class. Thanks. Thanks.